Okay, so thanks everybody um, for joining us, and we'll probably have a few more people uh, join us as we get started here. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Larry Hitchman. Larry uh, used to work here in Juneau. Um, he worked for the Archives Department. I had um, many opportunities to get to know him, and I really appreciate his sense of humor, but also his depth of knowledge. And so he has um, since retired from the State Library and is now um, living in the Kenai Peninsula. And he's also offered to share his expertise with public libraries, and he will tell, um, explain that further uh, later on in his presentation. So. Um, without further ado, uh, Larry, take it away. Thank you, Julie. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the wonderful world of archives. Uh, this uh, presentation is called What to Do When You Discover That uh, Cache of uh, Historical Papers, Letters, and Photographs in Your Library Collection. And uh, as you can see, uh, this often results in things like when Walt found skeezics on his doorstep saying, please take me in, uh, and uh, it can give you a good deal of uh, worry, but it also can be pretty rewarding. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is a useful principle is cooperate, 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 and communicate, communicate, and communicate. Uh, archives are usually rather small. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of clout. And the best way to deal with uh, an archival collection is get to know other archivists and work together, either finding information or uh, getting advice, or even there's perhaps a cooperative project you can do. Uh, the first thing I want to point out about uh, a useful activity is uh, where to get help. Um, I'm naming three sets of texts that you can get that do teach you to be an archivist. The first is the Fundamentals of Archives series, which is uh, prepared by the Society of American Archivists. It's, there are many volumes covering any subject you're interested in. Uh, and uh, it's the current uh, flagship um, training set that SAA uses. I would also like to mention, however, basic archives manuals. That was the old series, which actually I like better. Uh, they're out of print, but if you can get a set of them, it's worthwhile to do so because they are succinct. They're short and brief and to the point and very good. They're not out of date in terms of the content. So uh, if you can find a set of those, those are also valuable. Those are also done by the Society of American Archivists. The third thing is describing archives, the content standard, or the DAX manual, which is becoming fairly uh, common as an archival uh, how-to in creating finding aids. One of the major uh, issues that occurred in archives as everything became very digital is that archivists had always kind of worked on their own, created their own little system. Some were one kind of, kind of system, some were another, some were better, some were worse, but they were almost all idiomatic. And the DAX manual is helping to uh, take all of that huge amount of information that is available out there and turn it into a mutually understandable set. Uh, those three um, publications are the only three that I'll mention uh, that are, you ought to consider investing in, uh, but all three of them are very useful to anyone who's trying to do archival work. Also, there are three useful listservs. Uh, the first is the Alaskan Archivist Listserv, which is very small. I think it has 15 members at the moment. But I highly recommend uh, joining it if you are planning to do archival work in Alaska. It's got pretty much everybody who is a professional archivist in Alaska is on it, and most of them are eager to help. Uh, and uh, I've listed uh, um, email uh, websites, links throughout this presentation, but they're also in the um, 
uh, handouts, you probably want to go to there to get them. But I would highly recommend this list for anyone in Alaska who has archives or wants to have archives is thinking about archives. The second listserv is what I call the Great Intergalactic Archives and Archivist Listserv. It's the uh, big international listserv um, run by the uh, Society of American Archivists, and it has archivists of every type of description, educational, commercial, uh, private, uh, government, anyone in the field is there, and those people are also uh, very quick to advise and offer support, moral support. Uh, it's a worthwhile one. The third list serves as records and records management, which is kind of parallel to the archives and archivists listserv, except that it is uh, devoted to records management and records administration, and it's run out of the University of Cincinnati. Okay. Uh, where to get help, I want to give you an idea of where to get help in Alaska, because there are people who can help in Alaska. Uh, so I've listed the major archives in the state, the Alaska State Archives, the Alaska Film Archives. Actually, Alaska has two film archives. The University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, Rasmussen Library has a film archives. So does the University of Alaska Anchorage called the Alaska and uh, uh, let's see, what is that thing called? Uh, the Arctic, hmm, do I have it? Yeah, the Alaska Moving Image Preservation Association, uh, which is also located at UAA. Additionally, UAF and UAA have archives that uh, collect all formats, and uh, both of them are worthwhile, and both of them have people who can help. Uh, the Atwood Center at the uh, Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center is the archives for the Anchorage Museum. Uh, they're particularly strong in photographs and uh, are willing to help as well. And uh, then, in addition, I am listing uh, a number of individuals I checked with each one. Well, let's see. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, individuals in Alaska with expertise and knowledge who uh, uh, might be willing to be contacted and to to, to um, advise anyone who needs advice. Uh, so all of these people have already committed themselves. Yes, they will help if you need help. Uh, Dean Dawson is a state archivist. Unfortunately, I discovered after I prepared this that Dean Dawson will be retiring May 1st, but I'm sure whoever comes in to take his place will be equally willing to help. Uh, Chris Heeb has my old job at the State Archives and uh, is uh, very personable and approachable and can help. Zach Jones, who is now an archivist too at the State Archives, uh, was originally at the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation so that he has some feeling for Alaska Native records and collections. Karen Gray is the records analyst at the State Archives. Uh, she also has some archival experience. Uh, at the Alaska State Library Historical Collections, Jim Samard is the head of the uh, historical collections and knowledgeable and uh, helpful. I talked to Anastasia Tarman, who is uh, the manuscripts librarian and curator at the Historical Library and does a lot of, I think, the day-to-day -day management and work. At the Alaska Moving Image Preservation Association, Kevin Tripp is the archivist. And finally, there's the fellow at the bottom who, um, if anyone wishes to contact me, I'm here. I think what Julie was referring to uh, about helping libraries, etc., is that I will, if someone is on the road system and is willing to pay for my trans my gas to travel to and from where you are, I'll uh, make my own um, um, what, room and board arrangements and I, I won't charge a fee. 
Um, so just letting people know that. Okay, as to training, both the UAA archives and the Alaska State Archives have in the past presented workshops, but uh, they don't plan any, any for the foreseeable future because they say we think we've pretty much um, filled up uh, all of the uh, interest for that particular approach. We're going to go on to other approaches uh, for providing training. Um, one thing <clears throat> that it occurs to me that people might uh, be willing to do and that they might be willing to um, work with you on is doing an internship or a volunteership at either institution uh, for the uh, learning experience. Uh, the State Archives does have a uh, basic records management course, which I recommend. It's a good one. Uh, it is open to uh, local government people, and uh, the person to contact to get onto the mailing list is uh, the State Archivist. It's offered several times a year in Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau, although I don't know how the current budget crunch is going to affect that, it's worth uh, looking into. Additionally, online you can find Fundamentals of Archival Preservation by um, Megan uh, Friedel, who was an archivist at UAA, and it's a slideshow. I went through it recently. Uh, I put down the um, link as I found it. Uh, it's a cached link. You may just have to Google it, but it comes up and it gives a great deal of useful information. The best known training program in the United States is run by the National Archives, not surprisingly. It's open to archivists throughout the USA. You don't have to be a federal archivist. You don't have to be a government archivist. You can enroll in it. It's a two-week program. It's intensive. It's taught by senior staff. Uh, and um, the unfortunate thing is that there is only one scholarship to it. It's offered by the Daughters of the American Revolution, and it's mm -hmm. only available to archivists whose collections have material related to the Revolutionary War which sort of rules out everyone west of the Mississippi, <laughs> which is why the uh, uh, California State Archives and the Society of California Archivists developed the Western Archives Institute, which is also offered at various places in the country. And it's intended to be a cheaper alternative for uh, people in the Western states. It's essentially the same training. It's, again, by senior archivists around the country. It's worth looking into if you want to have an intensive two-week training period and uh, you don't feel that you can pay both airfare and housing, etc., to cross the entire continent to get it. The Society of American Archivists offers a variety of uh, training on different aspects of archival activity, and they offer them throughout the United States. I've taken a few. I took the business archives uh, training and then never dealt with any business archives. <laughs> uh, but um, the thing to do is go to the SAA website to, to determine what they're doing now and what uh, might uh, be available in the future. There are a few others. Uh, there's the American Association for State and Local History, which has, on occasion, offered a few archives and manuscripts training courses. Uh, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, do not be fooled by the geographic title. The uh, Northeast Document Conservation Center uh, covers the country actually, in one sense or another. And they have good conservation and digitization and digital archives training courses uh, available, which um, I took one in um, electronic and digital archiving, uh, which was at the University of Texas. Um, the, they will be all over the place. Um, if you get into one and you're from Alaska, they seem to think you're from further away than Mars. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's a very good 
it's in training. Uh, and the website is in the handout. Uh, now, while I was preparing this talk, I noted that the Archival Association of British Columbia was offering a uh, online course. And, no, wait a minute, it's a face-to-face -face course. And um, I, no, it's an online course, excuse me. <laughs> and so I contacted uh, the woman who uh, is coordinating it to find out about it. And she uh, indicates they all offer six courses uh, over, uh, I think it's two years, three each year. Um, they're relatively economical, we're not cheap, but uh, they would be very happy to see people from Alaska. It's, uh, it, it was one that was new to me and one I was very happy to see. Okay, funding sources. Everyone should know about the Alaska State Historical Records Advisory Board. It's the state's uh, referee board for the National Archives grants, and it also does whatever it can to help and support archival and manuscript activities throughout the state. Uh, the state archivist is the coordinator, and uh, he uh, welcomes people contacting him to talk about it. It's worth uh, worth looking into. The National Historical Publications and Records Commission is the National Archives Grants Funding Arm. The, uh, the, uh, the um, process is a little slow and uh, the standards are pretty high, but virtually every large local archival project in the United States in the last 30 years has been funded with NHPRC money. Uh, they have announcements regularly about uh, requests for proposals. Um, the best thing to do is contact the state archivist first and talk about the project you're envisioning uh, so that you know, you know in advance whether or not what you're offering will fly. They don't fund everything. Uh, and uh, they're fairly picky, and of course the money is tight. So I'd say contact Dean Dawson first, or his successor, uh, and talk about your project. But um, they would welcome, I think, more uh, projects offered from Alaska. The National Endowment of Humanities offers some small projects, um, grants. Uh, they're interesting, however, uh, and they seem to be things that the National Archives doesn't necessarily fund. And uh, I, the best way to find about, out about them is check their website, and they do make uh, regular announcements uh, via email. So if you can connect with uh, that, uh, it's, uh, you can uh, find a variety of, we uh, at the State Archives uh, hired a consultant to come and, and advise us on the quality and the preservation of our photographs, for example, uh, and uh, look into it. Uh, the Alaska Humanities Forum, I think the forum has supported a few projects with archival objectives, and I, I know the approach they take is send us a letter and describe what you're interested in, and we will tell you whether or not we think it's worthwhile. The Rasmussen Foundation. I'm not aware that the Rasmussen Foundation has ever supported an archival project, but it's worth, it won't hurt to ask. Uh, I, I do know about Rasmussen that they prefer to work with private entities, so what you need to do is find a non-government entity with whom to work, a uh, local historical society or uh, an interest group or something like that. But uh, perhaps it would be valuable for somebody to, to offer Rasmussen some uh, historical manuscripts type material. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now as to the steps to take, the first thing is to plan. You should plan early and plan often for that matter. Uh, and before the question arises in earnest and catches your flat foot, I recommend preparing a contingency plan as the best approach, although I know that's not easy to do when you have your uh, plate already very full. Nevertheless, that allows you, when the contingency arises, to have something to offer uh, from the beginning. Uh, 
about goals, uh, things to ask yourself. One thing that uh, I found somewhere else I think is a good question is, what would you like to see develop if you could have anything you want? You're not going to get anything you want, it, it, but nevertheless, it will give you some room for development, for negotiation, and for some talking points. And then what do you want to, your collection to do? Do you want it to teach? Uh, this is a valuable use of archives. So I have taught children as young as second graders about archives, and it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. It gets uh, schools in your area interested in and knowledgeable about you. Uh, do you want to support research? I suppose that's what most people want to do, and that's what most archives are famous for. Do you want to reach out? I really believe one thing archivists really need to do very badly is reach out rather than uh, sit and wait for people to come to you. Uh, they're likely to not even know you were there. Uh, so it's a worthwhile goal. And then I just put something else because there may be goals I'm not thinking of. Uh, here's an important consideration. Are you actively collecting uh, already? If you are, I'd say uh, you should seek some formal training. It's a whole lot easier to work with archives if you know some basic techniques that make it easier for you than it is to simply try to uh, wade through without much, much uh, in the way of um, hints about where to start and how to move. Uh, is the archives a part of the library? Uh, that's probably true in many cases, but sometimes archives are stored by contractual agreement with another entity. I don't think that's a bad idea. Uh, when you do that, of course, then you're, in a sense, going into a contracting situation, and you need to make sure that the contract is very clear about uh, what you will do, what the other party will do, uh, how long, and any particular options or uh, uh, issues that you need to be aware of when they occur. Uh, do you have a collection management policy? Um, I think this is very important. Uh, if you, um, it's part of planning. Is just if you know in advance what you're going to do and how big your um, collection uh, area will be, uh, it makes it easier on you than if uh, you don't know or if you have to create that once the stuff is on your uh, doorstep. Uh, do you have a deaccessioning policy? There are many uh, stories about poor deaccessioning policy. Um, and uh, while archives are permanent records and you probably want to be much more vigilant about what you discard in deaccession than you might be with um, published material, nevertheless, not every item that has been accepted is going to prove in the long run to have real long-term value. And you need to have a policy so you know how you're going to uh, decide that and how you're going to document what you've decided. Uh, do you have a collection inventory? It's kind of the first place to start in terms of organizing your collection. You really need to know what's there. And as I, as the uh, screen says, if you don't have these things, you should probably try to construct them early in the process. Support considerations. Uh, do you have an archives budget? Archives can be costly. Uh, it's one of the primary reasons that organizations shy away from archives, that it takes money if you're going to preserve material forever. Um, archives tend to be old. As you become elderly, you have a number of issues, <laughs> and the issues cost you money. Uh, and uh, that's true of documents as well as people. Uh, how will, this is a very important question, how will program activities be supported by long-term funds? Um, you're going to have to, if you're establishing an archives, you're going to have to determine 
some plan for how to make sure that once the um, grant project or the initial funding runs out, how you're going to continue to keep this archives running and, and practical and accessible. Um, Here's one option to seriously consider, and that's transferring to another institution. This often uh, offends people uh, because the records uh, are important for uh, emotional reasons to people. It's not always possible to do that. It's not always the best option. But um, at any rate, it's worth considering as the best approach, it allows people to, uh, more than one group, to work together on a common end. And it also sometimes defines where the records will get the best care and uh, um, access over the long term. Uh, so anyway, you need to plan uh, arrangement and description ahead of time. OK, I want to mention a few common practices that aren't recommended um, and why. One is accepting just anything that's offered. Many archives have started out that way and found that it wasn't a good idea. I know that, uh, for example, I worked for the South Dakota uh, State Archives and the State Historical Society had had a policy like that for years and no accessioning policy. And it was easier to find uh, volumes on the genealogy of New England than it was to find uh, stuff related to actually to South Dakota and its environs. Uh, and uh, accepting permanent loans is a very bad idea, the primary reason being that you may accept something that is really, really nice. And, might become the thing that people know you for and that you want to use uh, to your advantage, only to discover that heirs come along years later and tell you that their uncle didn't really mean to give you that. He was only loaning it to you. You need to avoid uh, accepting permanent loans. Um, if at all possible, have accession of things, a deed of gift that, expel, that spells out precisely what the conditions and restrictions for access are. Um, and digitizing just everything and then disposing of all hard copies is not a good idea. Uh, you need to have some backup. Um, Digitize uh, electronic uh, preservation is still in its infancy. There are some fairly big tiger traps. Uh, you need to think about what things you can simply dispose of and what things you need to maintain in case you have to redo the, the, uh, the work. I want to talk uh, short, briefly about record centers and archives. Record centers are for temporarily storing all your organization's records, uh, whether they're permanent or non-permanent, and uh, then disposing of them at set times in the future. An archives maintains permanent records only. My best advice on record centers is don't do records management if you can help it, unless you have background in it, because it's, uh, it's a detailed, uh, organized, professional activity that uh, can drain all of your resources if, if you let it. Again, it's something you may not have a choice about doing, but if you do, I would highly recommend the state's uh, records and information management course as your first step. OK, staff. <clears throat> One question is how large. Uh, archives take a lot of intensive um, work intensive work, individual itemized care, uh, deep knowledge. Uh, so you need to make sure you have a staff that is large enough to maintain the archives and provide access. Although something else I would say is that any collection has at least two sets of finding aids. One is the written 
or online finding aids to prepare. They're formal and organized and direct people to a particular collection for a particular purpose. The other set of finding aids is inside your reference archivist's head. Um, if you're going to be staff in an archive, you need, you need to be interested in the content of your records. Uh, how many need archival training? I would say if you've got two staff, then two need archival training. But it's up to the individual uh, institution to decide how much training is needed and, and who it should go to. Is someone assigned specific responsibility for the archives? I would very much recommend this. Uh, archives are a specialized um, full-time job. And they uh, archives do better, and your patrons are happier with you if someone has direct on hands-on uh, control and interest. Uh, does this person need archival training? Yes, they do. Uh, something I would say, however, is that professional status isn't the most significant thing about uh, responsibility for an archivist. The most important thing is they need to have a sense of commitment. You can't be an archivist for a while and then go do something else. It's a long-term commitment. Um, other types of help. Um, does the library have a private nonprofit foundation? Probably not. If it does, it might be one way to provide uh, paid staff or uh, develop a program for non-paid staff. Uh, does the library have any mutual help relationships with other community, government, or cultural institutions? Uh, that's another resource for finding people whom you can use, uh, volunteers, uh, uh, work study, um, whatever. And of course, there are other organizations in a community that have parallel interests. Schools may be looking for training for their students uh, or for occupations for the students. It's worth thinking about those two questions. Uh, interns are usually students who want to do this kind of work, or at least say they want to do this kind of work. Uh, and their payoff is new job skills, so you have to teach them a skill. That means that in it, it's not just free labor. You're going to have to commit some of your time and effort to training them uh, so that instead of one more FTE or a portion of FTE, uh, considering how much time they spend, it will probably be 75% of an FTE because you will be spending um, spending time uh, working, preparing assignments for them, and then uh, reviewing them and uh, uh, teaching them what they did wrong, what they did right. I'd say always assign discrete projects. Uh, don't design, just make work. It drives people nuts and drives them away. And then when a student does a project, review it carefully and require rewrites. That way they learn. One other thing that I found is very useful is if you have an intern and they perform well, you can write them a to whom it may concern letter of reference that they can use for job searches. That's slightly more payment than just having learned a job skill. Um, and uh, I recommend that fairly highly. There are, I think, three kinds of volunteers, basically. There are general, well, yeah, there are general uh, volunteers who are just people uh, who probably have limited skills but who offer to help. And what I have discovered is that some of these people can be uh, really valuable to you. They can learn skills. And while, again, they're not just slaves, so you have to, <laughs> they're there because of interest, so you have to give them something interesting. Nevertheless, if they take an interest in something, they may solve a minor problem for you that you don't have the time or resources to solve for yourself. There are liaison people. I haven't really worked with a lot of liaison people. These might be someone who has worked for a company, and the company gives you their records, and they come to help with it. I think the one thing that can happen if you're not careful is that they can get 
deeply involved in just uh, how interesting the company was, and uh, they will have a point of view rather than be really capable of organizing and um, preparing the stuff for outsiders. On the other hand, they really know the the uh, material and can probably make them much more accessible in terms of what is really important about this activity. Uh, then there are community uh, professionals, uh, people with uh, a high degree of knowledge uh, and uh, uh, professional knowledge. And uh, that's people like me, retirees, uh, former interns, people on a job search. Occasionally somebody will be looking for a job in archives but not have one. And it's useful to them both to uh, uh, have something to do and to have something else they can put in their resume. I've put community service workers under volunteers, but community service workers really aren't volunteers. When they come, they don't have much choice. Uh, you can sometimes find a very motivated person. And in that case, if you treat them in the same way as you do interns and volunteers, uh, they may do something for you that, uh, that you couldn't get done. Otherwise, uh, a uh, community service worker created an index of Alaska Railroad contracts for me that uh, otherwise I didn't have the time to prepare. And there were four or 500 of the contracts. And he simply uh, got other community service workers organized and did it in about a week and a half. Uh, there are disadvantages, though. And one of those is that many, many of your volunteers don't really want to be there. And you can end up babysitting. And uh, there's the I. There's also, I have found, a problem with establishing a workable work schedule. That, uh, at least in Juneau, the man in charge of community service workers would just send us two to six mm -hmm. out of the clear blue sky uh, when we weren't ready for them. And then we couldn't get them when we did. Uh, so uh, I'd say consider community service workers, but consider them with caution. Uh, then there's one other thing. That's consultants. They charge money. But sometimes you can uh, negotiate favorable contract agreements. Here you go. OK, processing. I really hate this term. Um, but it's the one the profession uses. So we, uh, we all refer to processing. I think it's way too vague. but. There it is. Uh, there is a difference between what librarians do and what archivists do. Librarians catalog by author, subject, and title. Archivists process, in other words, organize the records that they have. According to a functional approach, we arrange and describe records. And it's very important to know when you're doing this who created the records, what they were created to do and what their internal structure is, because those three things together will determine the, your arrangement and your uh, uh, description of the records. There are two primary principles in arrangement description. One is provenance. It means uh, the, where did the records come from? Uh, and organizations should always be organized together, not mixed with others. Uh, if you get records from one a lawyer and a um, um, historical society and a bank, and they all discuss a particular subject, you don't pull the records out of each and create a uh, subject file on that subject. You organize each of the records um, according to uh, who created them. All of the records of the lawyer will be one record group. All of the records of the bank will be another. And the historical society's records will be another. And that's a good thing, uh, because it assures that anyone who uses those records will, use, will be able to access all three in context and 
uh, with a thorough understanding of what that particular topic meant for that organization. <clears throat> Excuse me, original order is that collections themselves should not be rearranged. Here's the great secret about archives as an activity. Archives as uh, archives, archivist organization of records often is simply what the organization created for it. If the organization has organized a file according to some principle, alphabetic, geographic, numerical, whatever it is, that's the one you keep. That saves you a lot of time and effort in terms of organizing the records because you don't have to physically do it yourself. And you often don't have to create anything more in the way of finding aid except saying the records are organized alphabetically by name of patron or whatever. Uh, the steps in uh, arrangement are in organizing archives and processing is first accession it. It isn't really yours unless you register that uh, you have it. And in fact, uh, most archives have backlogs because they have limited staff and sometimes huge amounts of uh, collections. And many records, that's how you access them. It's according, yes, they were accessions. You know what uh, record group and series they are, and you move from there. Uh, the next thing you do is a stair-stepped approach. There are five levels of arrangement and description, um, and they are depository, record group, series, file unit, and document. And each uh, refers to a particular level of uh, the record's um, origin and how they and uh, background and content. Uh, but the greatest of these is series, and it's because it's functional. A series is a organized group of records or organized and created to do a particular function, an activity, and created by the same entity. And the beauty of the archival approach is that it allows you to divide and conquer because you can organize records to, on any of these levels as your need time and your resources provide, and then plan for deeper organization in the uh, future. Um, one thing I'd point out is that the lowest level is document, and archivists almost never organize records to the document level. It's just too time consuming, and it's, uh, and it's not really needed. If you know, for example, that uh, you're dealing with George Washington's papers, uh, then you can, and you want to know his papers on, say, purchases, uh, then you can simply look in the series dealing with purchases and you'll find whatever document you want, probably a great many that you want. Um, you can make uh, your description as detailed or as limited as you need it to be. And do what you can when you can do it and plan additional steps as time and resources allow. OK. OK. Tools, I've limited the list here to just a few. Uh, two open source um, resources, Archivist Toolkit, and Koha, um, but uh, something I should point out is that while both of these still say they are open source, I know that both have started charging a fee. It's relatively reasonable. It's worth uh, accessing or reviewing if you're planning to uh, organize records. Uh, then do you want to dis digitize your collection? Almost everybody does at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. But you should seek professional advice early. And Howard Besser is the recognized expert on long-term protection of electronic archives. Howard Besser, along with others, prepared the 1996 a Commission on Preservation and Access Report. And the three essential tasks that he indicated that uh, you needed if you wanted to sustain your digital archives are constant refreshing, migration, and emulation. I also looked at his website, and uh, he, on his website, he has uh, sustainability factors 
uh, that include disclosure, adoption, transparency, self-documentation, external dependencies, impact of patents, and technical protection mechanisms. Uh, I would uh, recommend reviewing those first before you begin to think about digitization, and then seek professional advice. Come on, you. OK, conservation and preservation is a specialty. And uh, that you can save yourself trouble by, again, first reviewing what you've got and then planning for what you've got. If your stuff seems to be stable, if it's just uh, looks fairly ordinary, it's not brittle, it's not falling apart, then you can kind of stick to some basic things. You can clean and dust the records. You can look for long-term issues and document them. So you have a plan. Uh, and you can then concentrate on how will I store this stuff? Will I use boxes and folders? How am I going to be able to walk to the shelf and get the material six months from now? Uh, what shelf locating system will I have? And if you can afford it, you can purchase acid-free material. I like acid-free material a great deal. But there's less emphasis now than there used to be on it, simply because uh, the records themselves will not be acid free and uh, they will immediately, or not immediately, eventually migrate into your acid free stuff. Nevertheless, it, it does provide an extra layer of protection for your material. Uh, but if you can't afford it, use regular supplies. Everybody does. Uh, serious problems. Uh, when you find certain things, you probably want to at least contact a conservator. Uh, and I'd start out either by contacting Scott Carley at the museum or by contacting, um, I, I think UAF may have a conservator, and uh, asking questions uh, with um, mildew or vermin. Uh, actually, mildew, if it's uh, not active, is fairly easy to take care of, but a conservator can tell you what to do. And that going, vermin means the critters and the varmints. Um, water damage, uh, if it's wet stuff, you want help as soon as you can get it. If it's just the stuff is damaged, then the conservator can tell you what is possible and what isn't. Um, and that's true for fading. Freezing and fire damage, um, talk to a conservator. If you have silver nitrate negative, contact a conservator immediately and put the negatives in a freezer. Silver nitrate negatives were the um, standard in the photographic industry before safety film was invented. Uh, and um, they catch fire very easily and they can explode. They also um, give off fumes that are poisonous. The best thing to do is put them in a freezer immediately and contact a conservator. Uh, it may be a long-term problem you have. It may be something that you simply have to freeze the, the uh, negatives and, uh, for the foreseeable future. But at any rate, that is what you should do. Uh, in terms of measurement, uh, measurement uh, can be somewhat confusing. Uh, some archives use linear measures. Some will use cubic measures. Both are acceptable. I'm used to uh, cubic measures, and mostly what I've put here deals in cubic feet. Um, if you have some small item and you need a cubic measure in terms of inches, multiply length times width times height, and then uh, divide by 1728, because 1728 is 12 times 12 times 12, and it'll give you a cubic measure. Um, a standard manuscript case, uh, which um, is one of the little gray boxes with the clamshell lid, is 3,300 cubic foot. Uh, it'll hold uh, five to 800 pages of documents. Uh, a large man, they make a large manuscript case with a separate lid that's half the size of a record center box, and it's uh, 
uh, half a cubic foot and will hold, oh, um, 1,000 to 1,500 pages. A Strum style manuscript case, which I like if I've just got a few things, is 2100 cubic foot. It's a fifth of a cubic foot. And it'll hold 100 to three or 400 uh, pages, depending on uh, density and what kind of paper you're choosing, etc. I didn't get record center box listed here. A record center box is one cubic foot and holds about 3,000 pages. Um, flat storage uh, for measuring what you measure is length times width times height, and then uh, divide if necessary. Um, ledgers. Um, I uh, always used to amuse myself when people would refer to uh, ledgers in my archives as books, because uh, they're not books. They're ledgers, or they're uh, uh, volumes. A book is uh, a published entity that has an author title and subject. Ledgers almost always are uh, uh, lists of content inside. Um, we have measured the uh, books at the State Archives, and I know the Alabama State Archives measured some, too. Books, didn't I just say books? Yes, volumes. To find out what is an average uh, size volume. And I think Alabama said it was 1,600 cubic foot. Our measurement was 1,700 cubic foot. Uh, and um, so that, but then of course when you're dealing with ledgers, you're usually dealing with groups of ledgers, so you probably just give a cubic footage for all of them together. That's a ledger that would have 350 to 500 pages. Uh, microfish uh, and card files both are about 100 sheets per inch. Of course, if you've got those hybrid microfish uh, that uh, uh, are jacketed, it's going to be a few fewer because then you've got three layers of uh, material there. Uh, and then a file drawer, one and a half to two cubic feet is what the file drawer will have, have. So that basically, if you're going through an office and you're going through uh, 16 file drawers, you'll know to bring perhaps 30 to 35 uh, boxes, record center boxes, to carry them away in. OK, storage. Um, Here's a good question. Do you have a budget for archival supplies? Because they're relatively expensive, and they have to be shipped. And by the way, if you ever are doing a large uh, purchase of uh, storage boxes or folders or whatever, contact Metal Edge. The reason to contact Metal Edge is that you may get three bids, but all of the other um, suppliers are on the East Coast, and they don't understand that you're going to have to have a shipping cost added for Alaska, particularly if you're in a place like Juneau, where you can't get in by road or air. Metal Edge can always undersell everybody else. I don't hold any stock in Metal Edge, but they have a uh, warehouse in Sparks, Nevada for the purpose of uh, shipping to those of us who live far from the East Coast. Um, then how will you store them? There are a number of ways. Uh, some places they simply keep them in the file drawers. It's not generally recommended. It's, it doesn't really help much in terms of making sure you don't use up space you could otherwise use. Shelves is usually what people use. Wood or metal. Wood isn't recommended. Wood has acids in the wood and they'll eat into your records. Um, metal, you want to have enamel steel metal shelves. Uh, and are you going to put them in a segregated area, which is uh, uh, recommended that uh, basically what you want your patrons to do is come and talk to you and say, I'm interested in this subject. And then you can say, well, we have this particular collection that might deal with that and bring it to them and watch them. And that way, uh, on the one hand, it allows you to manage your work day. And on the other hand, 
uh, it manages to um, discourage uh, theft, which can be a problem in an archive. Uh, flat boxes or flat files. Flat files is the technical name for map cases, which I invariably call map cases instead. Uh, and uh, if you can afford them, they're a good way to store material. They're very expensive. What I've noted is that with the movement to GPS systems, often if you can find a surplus house, they've got map cases to spare. Uh, but on the other hand, the other approach is flat boxes, which are uh, manuscript cases built for flat type things, and they come in several sizes. What I have found is that uh, you don't get much density because after a certain amount of material is placed in the box, it begins to become unwieldy and difficult to use. Um, in the final analysis, uh, always adapt to the best storage conditions you can under your own circumstances. Uh, archives is always a compromise between what would be ideal, which nobody ever has, and uh, what is actually manageable and will probably keep your records fairly well and uh, secure. Uh, measurements. Uh, I have a rule for measurements. All measurements are approximate. Um, uh, no matter how carefully you measure, you're dealing with uh, hundreds of pages put into boxes, and uh, they're not necessarily built. They weren't originally created to fit those boxes, and you just have to estimate no matter what. That's also true of inclusive dates. That, uh, no matter what date, how often you go to a file and look through it looking for the earliest and latest date, you're going to miss some sometimes if you have more than a few pages. Um, but uh, then um, a record storage box, a banker's box, uh, which is the little yellow box down here, uh, holds a cubic foot. They're made to hold records. They will hold letter-sized documents across the short axis. They'll hold legal-sized documents across the long axis. They'll hold about 40 normal-sized file folders and about 3,000 pages. Uh, and if your collection is large, if you uh, either in the sense of this manuscript collection or this record group is large, or in the sense that my entire uh, depository collection is large, I recommend using record storage boxes over manuscripts cases because uh, they uh, they're sturdy. They will um, protect the material very well. They actually help. Patrons, because a patron with 3,000 pages is happier than a patron with 800. And um, uh, they're, um, they're, I can't remember what my other reason was. Uh, a linear measurement, I've already gone across a manuscript case are the little gray boxes. Uh, they're very good for small collections. By the way, you can buy acid-free uh, record storage boxes. Uh, it's not a question of sacrificing acid-free to storage. I know the other thing. Uh, you get more density on the shelf with uh, record storage boxes. I happen to know from uh, working with them that if you have a shelf that will hold six record storage boxes, you will get six cubic foot on the shelf because each box is a cubic foot. But if you try to replace them with the half-size Hollinger boxes, manuscript cases, you'll get about five feet because uh, you can't get more than than uh, that number of boxes on the space. And if you use the smaller ones, as is illustrated here, uh, you get about Oh, four and a half feet, but it just translates into more density so that you use your space much more economically with the record center boxes. Okay, reference service. Archival reference service is... Hey, hey Larry, to, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I just want to butt in real quickly. I know that we're going to be uh, ending pretty shortly here, and I wanted to be sure that people had a chance to ask you a question. Um, okay. Before the end of it, so um, we can stop now if you like. Okay.
Okay. Oh, let me give the homework assignment though. Uh, go to um, YouTube and watch these two videos. You'll enjoy them and uh, you'll learn. Okay, I'm through. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. So, folks, if you have a question, please ask Larry uh, right now, and you can um, we can do it in the text box, or you can do it uh, mute your uh, microphone. But you have a great opportunity to ask him a few questions before the end of our webinar here. Hey, Julie, are we going to get a hard copy of the presentation? Yes, we're going to post Larry's uh, his webinar, the archived webinar, and all of his handouts. And Larry, you might want to real quickly just show everybody your handouts real quick. Okay, let's see. That's up here. Okay. Got here. Uh, this is a um, volume conversion table that the uh, State Archives developed over a number of years that uh, will give you, um, rather than doing a lot of uh, multiplying length times to width times height, uh, and then dividing by 1728. This is my discussion of processing. It's pretty much like what we uh, covered here. This is the um, five levels of archival arrangement description. If anyone has trouble understanding what I'm mean because it's hard to discuss that briefly. Uh, just contact me and I'll be glad to talk to you by phone or email. Okay, uh, bibliography, um, and I've put it in two categories, important and other, and uh, I've included the fundamentals series in the important and the uh, basic archives manuals and the not so important, and there are a few other things there too. There is a uh, uh, basic manual on Native American archives, and I think it still is in print if anyone is interested in it. There are also manuals on business archives and religious archives. Okay, this is what I have on reference service, and it's basically, uh, I think, the two archives and library reference are pretty much the same thing, but archivists really have to be careful about uh, restrictions, copyright, uh, and so on. and. Uh, let's see, there was something in my other, my, my, I've got another version of this and I'll try to get it to you, Julie, that, uh, oh, wait, it is referrals. Something to do is be really familiar with other people's collateral collections because one of your jobs is to, or your primary job is to help a patron find information he's looking for and it may not be with you. I have a uh, illustration of a, a, um, Record center box, uh, and is that all? Let's see, there are a couple. Of, you know, there's the Hollinger box, uh, and there's one on planning considerations, which I think is where everyone should start is planning. All right. Hello. <laughs> Harry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Hey, is there any way to get a copy of those YouTube videos again? I have too quick on the screen, I didn't get it. Um, well, let me go back to the, let me find it. Uh, it's. I think I've got them in the finding aids or in the um, um, in the handouts too. But this one, uh, let's see. No, that that's just the reference to this. Yeah. Um, I uh, if you uh, go to YouTube and simply type in archives madness, it'll come up. Archive madness will come up. Uh, and I think so. What is an archivist? Actually, I suspect if you type in either title, you'll get it and the other one and several others as well. 
Okay, and, and Larry, there's a question from Sheila uh, Ring. Um, do you recommend a particular scanner for digital archiving? Um, I'm too digitally uh, impaired to, uh, to do that. Uh, the person probably to talk to about that is at the State Archives, and I'd say talk either to Chris Heeb or um, Zach Jones. They're probably better informed about that. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording. And um, again, we'll be posting um, the, re the archived uh, recording of this webinar to our uh, web page. And all of uh, Larry's materials will be there as well. So thank you very much, Larry, and thanks to everybody for um, attending. It was, it was really interesting, Larry. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.